I am a thief I am a murderer Walking up this lonely hill What have I done? Well, no one <laughs> I gotta start the over, I'm sorry There's my mulligan <laughs> Fingernail gun away. Okay. I am a thief. I am a murderer. Walking up. Lonely Hill What have I done No I don't remember No one knows Just what I feel And I know That my time Is coming soon It's been so long Oh such a long time since I've lived in peace and rest Now I am here My destination soon And I know That my time is coming soon Who is this man? Fading, but I deserve what I receive. Jesus, when you are in your kingdom, would you please, please remember? Transitional, and transitional chapter tonight that goes into the tribulation as we share God's word. Now tonight, um, I enjoy eschatology. I enjoy the study of God's word pertaining to prophecy, and uh, and I pray tonight what God's placed on my heart will not only be enlightening, educational, informative, but also it'll be uh, inspiring to your heart. If you're saved tonight, you don't have nothing to worry about as far as your eternity and your future. You really don't. If you're not saved tonight, you've got every reason to worry and be concerned because I'm not even scratching the surface of the intensity of what it's really going to be like. We've seen things that have happened on this earth back in uh, September the 11th. We saw uh, a horrible event 
transpire. We've seen other things happen in the United Kingdom. We've seen things happen in Paris. We've seen things happen just not from that uh, standpoint, but also from, a, uh, from tsunamis and earthquakes and all types of difficulties that's invaded this earth. We find that the Revelation deals just not with us, but it deals with the entirety of the globe of what is going to happen. We read Revelation, we think, wow, is this really, or is this a science fiction? I can promise you, God's Word is not science fiction. It is just as factual as it's going to be, and what God said in His Word will take place. So, tonight, and right after I kind of get into the message a little bit, something is going to happen that's going to take you into something that's going to be on the screen. So, just kind of roll along with it, and uh, don't think that I've lost my mind. I did that a long time ago. But, uh, and if you have the mind for Christ, you've lost your mind for the world anyway. So, uh, you know, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Unlocking Revelation, we're dealing with chapter 6 of the book of Revelation tonight, the last book in the Bible. And one of the bookends, the other, of course, is Genesis that houses the entirety of the Bible. Tonight, we continue on this journey through this powerful prophetic book of Revelation. And we will use a biblical key tonight to open the door of Revelation and each chapter as we go through, we will use this key that gains us access because the title of this series that we're on is Unlocking Revelation. God wants you to know what He says in the Revelation. He also wants you to know, you know, it's just really odd. I'm spending a lot of time in Revelation on Sunday night and on Sunday morning since the beginning of this year. I've been spending a lot of time in the book of Genesis. So uh, do you think that's an accident? I don't. I think it's what God is declaring and prescribing for us that we need. And, uh, and I count it a joy tonight to be able to study His Word in Revelation and then tonight to disclose what God is trying to speak to our hearts in preparation for that great day when it shall come. So there we're going to find information along with what we call inspiration that gives us a better understanding of the book and what the future holds. You know, God is not trying to keep you tonight in the dark he wants you to know what the future holds, and He wants to know what your future holds. He wants you to know that you can have a home reserved in heaven for you, and that you one day will be there. And as you read, and whenever we get to chapter 21 and 22, we'll, we'll see about that great place that God has prepared for us, a street of gold and walls of, of diamonds and gates of pearl and mansions and all the things that's there. But as I've said before, that's not what makes heaven heaven. If heaven was nothing but a mud road, a mud street, and cardboard shacks and Jesus was there, it would still be heaven. But I'm here to tell you, it's not cardboard shacks, and it's not a mud street. It is exactly what God's Word says that it is. In John 14, Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a mansion for you, and that can be yours in Christ with certainty of the future. I go to bed at night not worrying. I go to bed at night not in a state of hysteria about what's going to happen if I don't wake up or what's going to happen if something goes bad in this world. I don't worry about that because anchored in my soul is something that God put there. I know, as Paul said, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. In other words, what I'm trying to say in, emphatically is the fact, see, I know that I know that I know I'm a child of God, and regardless of whatever happens in this world, it's not my final home. That whether God calls me by death or whatever occurs, I know that I've got a place reserved in heaven, thank God, where he said in Revelation 21, 4, where there's no weeping and He'll wipe away all tears, and there's no death, there's no sorrow, there's no more pain. For these things are passed away. In other words, they're gone. And I have reserved in heaven for me a home, not built with hands, but eternal in the very presence of our God. The book of Revelation is the final act of human drama or the climax of thousands of years of history that we've seen on 
Wednesday night, we've been going through the climax of human history, and we've been looking at the occasions, the events, and many of them that involve the nation of Israel, and see how they connect with God's Word and how they point to the coming of the Lord. So the book of Revelation tonight encourages Christians tonight that we can be kept in hope tonight while we're alive on this earth. I'm glad, blessed hope. A blessed hope that says we can one day experience the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It recognizes the hard fact of worldwide issues and persecutions and problems, yet it assures you and I tonight as God's people of certain victory. You don't have to go through life minus a victory in your life. Are we problematically free tonight? No, by no stretch of the imagination. But tonight you've got a victory that has been placed within your heart that Christ has given you through salvation. Therefore, tonight, whatever you face, you know that God does exactly what he says he will do in Romans 8, 28. He will work all things together for your good. Even in your problems, he tonight will bring a victory. Even in your despairs, he will bring deliverance. Even in the burdens that you shoulder, he will bring a blessing. So tonight, listen, God is with you. God is for you. Nothing is going to change that. No one can change that tonight. All obtainable through a salvation experience. Mine happened on the 2nd of February, 1975. Jesus changed my life. And you know what? I've experienced that change ever since. He is continually, I have not aspired to the place that I'm all I could, should, and ought to be. But thank God I'm not what I used to be. And thank God he has worked in my life and refined me and is using me and he still hasn't finished with me yet. Thank God. So the book of Revelation presents, we could say it presents an overview of the future, if you would. Understanding this fact tonight that the title role tonight belongs not to the Antichrist, but to the real Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. So tonight, as we've been saying through this study, Revelation, the book of Revelation, is about transformation. It's about changing. It's about bringing the work of God into our heart and into our lives. Now, let's take tonight this next key. Let me slide this thing down a little bit. Let's take this next key in chapter 6 and see the events that basically will take place after the rapture coming of the Lord Jesus. Now, we know that we looked at a, a span where instantly, in the moment and the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15, we shall be changed. What is this transformation? This is the same transformation that Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel. The dead in Christ shall be raised, and we who are alive and remain, thank God, will meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. It's what we call the rapture coming of Christ. Now, let me just give you a little something here tonight for understanding. The word rapture, you can read all 66 books and every letter, every, every chapter, every word. You will not find the word rapture in this Bible. But the concept of the rapture is. Rapture is, and is interpreted meaning a sudden snatching out. And that's what's going to happen when Christ comes in the sky and calls his church home as the word ascribes to tonight. We, the children of God, will be in that number when the saints go marching in. Thank God. So that decision that you made somewhere in life it may have been recent, it may have been today, it may have been several years ago, it may have been a long time ago. What that decision has guaranteed you, that if you are on this earth, which you shall be, that when Christ comes, even if you're in the grave, you're going with him, or if you are alive, you're going with him, that that transformation is going to take place, and you and I will be in that change. Well, this mortal will put on immortality. This corruptible will put on incorruption. For Paul said, we shall be changed. Not an issue of debate, it's an issue of fact, of what God's Word says. 
But something then catastrophic happens after this glorious, instantaneous, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, quicker than the snap of my finger. Something's going to happen after that occurs. This world will go into a period called Jacob's Trouble or Daniel's 70th week, or it is called the Tribulation. Now, in the following chapters, as we're going to see, and the verses that we're going to learn, and, and, and I'm going to try to explain it to you, we're going to talk about four riders of what we call the four horsemen of the apocalypse tonight. We're even going to deal with tonight's seven seals of judgment that will be peeled back and God's wrath will be poured out upon the face of this earth. Then we will see seven trumpets that will be sounded that will bring about even greater judgment. Then we will see seven bowls or vials of judgment that are poured out with even more wrath and more fury from God that will be poured out on all the inhabitants that are remaining here on earth who have rejected Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Also, we will we'll see the deceiver on earth that we know by Scripture title as the Antichrist. But also, there's another one that is called the false prophet who will lead the, ch the church during that time. Wait a minute, Pastor. Wait a minute. Hold the phone. You mean to tell me there will be church on this earth after Jesus comes back? Yes, but it's going to be a false church. I didn't say false church in Northern Virginia. I said a false church that will worship the Antichrist, and in essence what they're worshiping is Satan. So all these personalities basically tonight that bring about the problems are secondary tonight to Christ Jesus. Folks, for he is tonight, don't you ever forget this. He is the, the King of kings, and he's still the Lord of lords. His name, as Isaiah said, is Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. Behold, he comes, riding on a cloud, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. Lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee out of Zion's hill. Salvation comes.
King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is coming back. Well, thought I'd throw it in for you tonight. The book of Revelation tonight is designed to transform tonight your theology. Not only tonight will it transform your theology, but it will even transform your daily living. It will transform your praise. It will awaken you to the reality of Jesus in your life. It will even transform your shout. Amen. I told you here, and I've preached this before, not tonight, but uh, there's a message that I love to preach, and it's about the seven acts of praise and how that we are to be the instruments. Let everything that hath breath do what? Shut up and be quiet, hide in the pew, go to sleep? No. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, praise ye the Lord. Also tonight, it will transform your victory tonight. You, I mean real victory, not just some victory, not just a partial victory, but a total victory tonight. It will transform your prayer life. You will, you will start praying different. I mean tonight, God will move on your prayer life. It will transform your hope. It will even transform your faith tonight. It's transformation because it's revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So the book of Revelation should be, this is my feeling, and I believe it's one tonight that surely has, uh, has tonight the, the, the support of God's word. I believe tonight this the book of Revelation be, should be preached in all churches. I really do tonight. Because Revelation 1-3 says, We must keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The time is at hand. What time is at hand? The time in which we're living right now. You say, well, preacher, come on. I mean, we've been hearing this story about Jesus coming and rapture and tribulation and all these things it hasn't happened yet well even Peter said you know the scoffers come and they say so where's the promise of his coming well let me tell you what the promise of his coming is right here and you may not have seen it happen but one day you're going to see it happen and the conditions of this world and this is the main reason I am preaching this because I believe that there is a clarion call coming from heaven one day to come up hither and it's going to come at a time when we least expect it as we're living in today. See, people are looking at the circumstances of politics in the world, the economy of morals and all the other issues that we're facing. And all they're seeing is basically what is before them. But they're not seeing what the plan of God says will happen. And let me tell you right now. I read this book. I have spent years in prophecy study. I have examined what God's Word says. I have researched. I have prayed over. God has given me uh, an inspiration of His Word and knowledge of His Word. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's only one thing that needs to be done, and that's the coming of Christ. Everything is in order. Everything is in place. And tonight, God's got it all under control. So God then says, well, I, I want you to know now, I'm not giving you the day, I'm not giving you the hour, I'm not going to tell you exactly when I'm coming because he knows the plight of humans tonight because every one of us would have put it off to the last second, last moment when Christ comes and then all of a sudden say, oh, God saved me, let me get, let me get in. And that's not the way it works. I'm glad that God's been very gracious to us to say, I'm not telling you the day, the hour in which I shall come, but I will give you the things to look for that will bring about my coming. So God is not a date setter. So those folks that go around date setting and saying, Jesus is coming back on this date. Let me tell you what, you might as well take that and throw it in the rubbish can. Because that's exactly what it is. No man knows the hour, not even the angels in heaven, the word of God says. So tonight God knows. But God's been very kind to us to say, I will show you the events so that you have your house in order when I shall come. So we believe tonight, listen now. We believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of all born-again Christians. This mentality of the rapture happening somewhere in the middle of the tribulation or at the end of the tribulation, there is no evidence in God's Word to prove it. But there is evidence in God's Word. Just one example, Paul told the church at Thessalonica, you shall escape the wrath which is to come. The wrath is the tribulation. But what? If this could be the day Jesus comes. Well, Pastor, I mean, it's getting in tonight here, and the day's about spent, and time's about gone, and 
I mean, he's not coming tonight. Surely, friend, you can't say when he's coming, but you better be ready when he comes. What's the preparation that's necessary? He said, watch and pray. Well, that watching tonight means that you are in relationship with him tonight. Well, I come to church, and I mean, doesn't that put me in relationship? No. I'm a good person, and I do the best I can. Does that put me in relationship with him? No, it does not. What puts you in relationship with him is acknowledging your sinner, acknowledging that died on the cross for your sins, and receiving him into your heart and your life. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're sitting in this church tonight, and you're not saved, you're not going to heaven. And that's not because I said so, that's because God said so. I use the scripture this morning as I use about every week, John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But then we flip over and we look and we see in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved. So we use that term, and that's a biblical term. Saved, salvation, born again. So that salvation, born again experience is when you come to the end of you, your sin, and you come to the salvation and the grace that God has given us, and we ask him to come into our heart and our life and save you. And I'm going to tell you right now, the word of God says you're sealed unto the day of redemption. There is, I know churches are preaching a heresy tonight, telling you you can lose it, you can have it and lose it, you can be in, you can be out, all this other stuff. There is nothing scripturally tonight that supports that, and that's heresy. It's a lie from hell. God's word says, if you call upon him, he saves you. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. It doesn't say in paren beside that, and then you can lose it. He sealed you. I mean, tonight, when we, we're trying, and I don't know why God's got me on this, but when we're trying to say tonight, well, you've got to get saved over and over again, Folks, Jesus came and died once for the sins of all the world. And that means he would have to come back and die again and again and again. And not to mention tonight, when you're saying that you can have it and lose it and have it and lose it and lose it and have it, well, one, it creates an atmosphere of confusion. And God says that he is not the God of confusion. But also tonight, you are saying, God, you are not able to keep what you said. When he said, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. You tonight are saying, I can worship my authority over your authority, and therefore I can snatch myself out of your hand. I can remove myself from your salvation. You can't do it. No one can. And the devil can't do it. You are sealed unto the day of redemption, but you first got to come to the place where God seals you by receiving him as your personal savior. Now, well, that ground work set before us tonight, we, we've got to realize there's a period of seven years following the rapture during which every sign can be adequately fulfilled by God's word, by what God has said. Revelation 6 is where the sign begins. So presently the signs are casting their shadows upon this world right now with the things that are occurring in all realm of life. The, the sign is, is not only Christ appearing, uh, it, it's everywhere, but the sign of impending tribulation is on the horizon tonight. There's something that's just shouting and proclaiming, he's coming back, he's coming back, he's coming back. So the tribulation is divided into two portions, three and a half years called the tribulation, three and a half years called the great tribulation. So in the first three and a half years, a world leader comes to bring a false peace out of anarchy and perplexity because as we shared last week, and or actually on Wednesday night, I think it was, I say so much, I don't know when I said what I said. But anyway, I promise you, I tell you what it said in God's Word, that these events that will take place, uh, folks, it, it, it's going to be a, a time and a season that when this happens, planes will, I mean, things are going to happen, planes will follow the air because how do you fly a plane without a pilot? There will be catastrophe and there will be a, a time of dilemma and tragedy and things that are happening on this earth beyond our perception and beyond even what our mind can try to perceive and grasp. Far beyond what happened 
on 911. Far beyond what happened from earthquakes and tsunamis and natural disasters. Far beyond all the atrocities that's happened in life. This world leader, and he will appear on television screens, and the title and the the title will not come on the screen, Antichrist. It will come on with a name, and he'll be a world leader. He will lead this entire world. He will bring all nations together. And I'm sure agents such as the United Nations and the World Council of Churches will be in his arsenal to claim and to even calm the nation and the people and to restore confidence uh, that... Everything is going to be all right. We have had something catastrophic happen here. We have no explanation. We don't understand. And, and there might be some far-fetched things. You know, I, I don't read tabloids, but I, I tell you, I've been through grocery lines and those stupid little paper magazines that are sitting there, and, and they got all these little weird shape head people and all this other crazy stuff, and aliens were spotted here, and there's been all kinds of television programs about uh, all the things, and aliens and people, and this area, and that event, and all this, and all these things that they've got stored back in Area 51, and everything else. I mean, listen, all that's crazy stuff. And people will believe, listen to me, people will believe a lie because there will be no other explanation on this earth that will make any sense. I mean, really? Jesus Christ, the King of glory, comes back and snatches people out of this earth? You think the world's going to believe that? No, they're not going to believe that. Chapter 6 opens as we read in verse 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, of noise, of thunder, one of the uh, four beasts saying, uh, Come and see. See what? What, are you, what is he coming to see? Well, see this world leader, this Antichrist come. And as Jesus, the Lamb of God, who is worthy, he is about to open the seal, the first seal judgment upon the face of this earth. And friend, I'm telling you, it's going to be wrath poured out on this earth. The first item is the revealing of the horsemen of the Apocalypse, the four horsemen that we know of the apocalypse. So the four horsemen ride through eternity, and we find, and in, in, in they ride basically through the entirety, I should say, of the tribulation. So each four riders represent a segment of time and represent a segment of judgment that God will pour out on the earth. So the first rider rides a white horse. The rider of this white horse, some people say, oh, well, that must be Jesus. Oh, no, it's not. Jesus appears in Revelation 19 riding a milky white stallion and on his thighs, faithful and true. And hallelujah, he comes back and destroys, I don't want to get ahead of myself, destroys the Antichrist and the armies of the Antichrist in what we know as the Battle of Armageddon. It's not what the movie theaters show you as Armageddon. It's not a dude flying some kind of a plane and got a cigar stuck in, his, in the corner of his mouth and he's winning and he's the champion. That's not the story. Unbelievably, a lot of people believe that. So, we live in a generation where honestly you can't tell the bad guy from the good guy anymore, can you? The Antichrist is riding a white horse. He attempts to do what? Deceive, because that has always been the method that Satan has used called deception. But don't forget, there's another rider, as I told you, that's coming back in Revelation 19, and he does not deceive, but thank God he delivers. He'll deliver you from your sin. He'll deliver you from everything that you're facing because our God, he's just not interested in saving your soul. He's interested in being Lord of your life. Your God, your friend, the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's always there when everybody else has walked out, when there's no one else around, when no one else cares. I'm telling you, there's a God in heaven that does care for you, amen. amen. And his name is Jesus Christ. What a Savior we have on our side. Now realizing this, we've got to remember something tonight that we've let the world manipulate us into thinking about the authority of Satan that he can manipulate and he can do anything he wants to do. He has no authority. He has no authority. His hellish triune, the son of perdition, we find will have a bow, you read, 
And I'm not going to read every verse, but you'll see he has a bow, but there's something missing. Typically, if you're into archery, you, if you have a bow, you don't just walk, ride your horse with a bow and say, <laughs> look at my bow, man. I mean, I got the best. But that bow is absolutely no good without what? Arrows. There are no arrows in his quiver. There's no arrows. So it's a false peace that he is bringing. So here, our mighty conqueror, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, King Jesus, he says he has a sharp two-edged sword, bless God, and he has all authority in heaven and in earth. The Antichrist is an imposter. He tries to mimic the Christ, the Lord Jesus. Satan tries to mimic the work of God. And the false prophet will try to mimic the work of the Holy Spirit. But let me tell you, just as sure as that there's a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there's a hellish trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. They will go about deceiving. Revelation 6 and 2 says, And I saw and behold a white horse. He that sat upon him had a bow and a crown and was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. The word of God says Jesus declared on the cross, what? Three words. It is finished. He is not going to conquer. He is already conquered. Amen. He is already conquered. He has already won. Jesus has already conquered death, hell, the grave, and the devil. We have victory in Christ tonight. In Revelation 6, 2, the Antichrist, he says we'll have, you know, uh, uh, the, the tense here, it's a singular tense, isn't it? A crown. It didn't say crowns. In Revelation 19, 12, on the head of Jesus, it says there are many crowns. Matthew 28 and 18, Jesus said, all power, again, I use that scripture. If he has all crowns and crowns on his head, he possesses all authority, all power. Just not tonight in the heavens, but on this earth. You say, well, I just don't want to send something here. So why are all these events and things taking place? I mean, I just, I'm confused about the world. I'm confused about everything. Folks, you've got to put your confidence and your faith in God. We're living, as I've been preaching on for six months, uh, five months, on from the book of Genesis about the fall of man, the creation of God, and how that man fell prey to the temptation of the serpent, which was Satan, but thank God, as I pointed out this morning, God is a merciful and gracious God that extends his mercy and grace to all that will receive it. Amen. And I'm glad that he extended that to me and to you and to every person that will call on his name. So the first seal of judgment is the false peace. The Antichrist will deliver this false peace to the world. And the second seal is removed. And there's the rider of the red horse. Revelation chapter 6 and 4. And there went out another horse that was red in the power. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. And that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now listen. Folks, there will be war during the tribulation period. So power is given to the Antichrist to take peace from the earth. That means tonight, if he has power to take peace from the earth, then tonight, while we are here, God's peace with us is, is with us on this earth. You have a peace that God has given you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 14, 27. Peace, yeah. An inner peace. Not a peace at a negotiation table between political leaders. Peace that comes from God into your soul into your heart, into your mind, into your life, that you can face what you face in life, but you have the peace of God that carries you through those trials and difficulties that you encounter. Man, I tell you what, I don't know what my wife and I would have done if we didn't have the peace of God with us. Amen, through the years. I'm glad that peace is with us. And you know what? The devil's peace is a false peace, and he gives a false prosperity. Everything the devil gives is a counterfeit. I mean, it's, it's, it's sorry. You ever got, ever got a counterfeit $50 or $100 bill? <laughs> you probably got an Indian 
Indian hidden penny in there too, a nickel or something, whatever they were. Wheat penny or something, I don't know. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. But anyway, everything the devil brings to you is false. Everything he gives to you is false. And if you don't have peace right now, I'm telling you, you know whose fault it is? It's your own fault. It's your own fault that you don't have the peace because you can look to the prince of peace as he's called in, in uh, Isaiah 53 and tonight he'll give you peace but let me tell you what the peace he gives you does. It surpasses, it exceeds, it's beyond tonight whatever you could imagine. Peace that surpasses all understanding. You can stand on the raging storms of your life and you can shout out, peace be still. Jesus did it. The disciples were about ready to crack and fall apart as the ship was. The storm was boisterous. It was beating the ship. The rains were driving. The winds were blowing. Jesus took a nap. Praise God. That's a beautiful story there. And guess what happens? The disciples come and say, Pastor, carest thou not that we perish? I, we're about to go under and you're down here taking a midday nap. Just had a peanut butter and banana sandwich. On some kosher bread. <laughs> Jesus spoke to the winds and the waves and said, peace be still. Folks, don't let this world control you. Let the Spirit of God give you peace amidst your storms. Because you're going to have them. As long as you're on this earth, you're going to have them. But man, you got somebody that's already won the victory in the storms that you face. Amen. You know... By mutual consent of all nations, something happens. Ten nations will merge into a united force. However, the northern confederacy that we know as Russia has other plans. And you, I, I teach, taught on this uh, back uh, sometime or another here a while back. And, and talking about in the book of Ezekiel, I talk, uh, preached on that for quite a while. But even recently, the, the prime minister of, of, of Russia, Vladimir Putin, he said, I don't know if you saw that little clip on the news this past week, and he finally spoke in English, and this was concerning the, the issue with what's happening with uh, uh, Washington and, and President Trump and this climate issue and this Paris pack. And Putin says, don't worry, be happy. Did any of you see that? Where have y'all been? I mean, if I saw it, and I don't watch hardly any television, and I saw it, that, it did happen, didn't it, Cynthia? I mean, I wasn't, <laughs> I got to make sure here I wasn't, had fallen out or something on the sofa and went to sleep or in the bed or something, you know. <laughs> he did say it. But what's going to happen here is, listen. Russia's going to come down on Israel in war, but God's sword will prevail and Russia will be defeated. You look back at what happened in 1967 in the Six-Day War. I mean, it was the insurmountable odds that were against Israel. It was no way they could win, but they had God on their side, and they did. Next, in verses 5 and 6, we find the black horse. So we've seen the white horse, false peace. We've seen uh, the second horse, and, and there we see there's the red horse, which is war. Then there's the black horse, and this black horse is, is reflective of what happens in the spoils of war. There's famine and there's desolation. So Ezekiel 7 and 19 says, They shall cast their silver in the streets, and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. Hoarding is not going to work. Building yourself a little place in the ground that you think will be protective of you and you've got bottles of water stashed up and you've got all this other stuff. And here back some years ago, you remember people were building bomb shelters. It was nothing but a prelude of people knew what was going to happen or the fact of the fear that something catastrophic could happen. What are you going to do when Jesus comes back? Go ahead and go down and buy Gobs of water. Get a tractor trailer load and have it delivered to your house from Sam's Club. Put it on the shelf. And I'm going to tell you, when God says all the water will be turned to blood, that means what's in those bottles will be too. Amen. It will be worse than the Depression. I wasn't there in 1920, I promise you. 
But the depression of 1920 will be a cakewalk compared to what is going to happen during the tribulation. Then we find in verses 7 and 8, the pale horse. So there's false peace, there's war, there's famine, there's difficulty, desperation. And then here comes the rider of the pale horse, which represents death. Which represents the wrath of God. Note verse 8, death's companion. Death has a companion. For he says, and I looked, behold, a pale horse, and his name that set upon him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. Death and hell are companions. So when you die as a Christian, death has no defeat. You go into the presence of Almighty God. But for every soul that has rejected Christ, their soul goes, as their body goes into the earth, their soul goes to the depths of hell, the holding cell for that great judgment that will happen that we'll see later on called the great white throne of judgment. So the first three and a half years of the tribulation will be false peace by a false messiah. The rider of the pale horse destroys the body, then he swallows the soul up into hell. And then if you reject Jesus as your Savior, you will see that you may even experience the false peace, the war, the famine, and death. I think that would be the worst thing that could ever happen is to miss the sudden removal of the church, the saints of God, from this earth. Disease will be uncontrollable. The beast of the earth will multiply. I've just noticed something here recently. I'm in and out of the hospital visiting people, just not our people, but others, other people too. And I've noticed it just seems like, and I don't know why. Sue, you work over there, and maybe you can tell me, why are there so many of those little yellow, yellow com, uh, things on the door about contact precaution because of potentially catching something. It seems like every other door has them on it. Contact precaution. You've got to put on a yellow suit and the purple gloves and sometimes you've got to put on a mask. It's more and more of that. There's more and more concerns. I told you before, I've been out of the military a few years but the 12 years I spent on active duty and the last five years that I was on active duty, I went through a lot of mock war situations, things that I thought, this is really ridiculous. Chemical warfare, biological warfare, things that would happen and so forth and all the exercises and all the mock-up war situations and the disbursement of people and places and times and everything. And I thought, this is an exercise, but we had to, we had to act like it was real stuff. But I thought, there's no way this could ever happen. I'm telling you right now, it can happen. And even to a greater degree and extent than I ever thought. Isaiah 5, 14 says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. Do you realize there's more said in the Bible about hell than there is about heaven? Do you? I haven't read anywhere in the Bible that says hell, or heaven rather, has enlarged itself. But I just read it to you there from the book of Isaiah. Hell will swallow up the hurting, the hordes of humanity that we don't reach with the gospel. That's why next Saturday we're going to canvas our neighborhood out here. We're not going to beat people up. We're just going to go door to door and say, come to church. Come experience something good in your neighborhood. And get them in here and give them the gospel. Amen. Revelation 6, 9 through 11. I've got to hurry up and finish here. The fifth seal. Let's read it. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest Yet for a little season 
until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So this is the evidence of the people that will be saved during the tribulation. Now, let me just give you a little, little uh, something here on the sidebar of this thing. Don't think, sit here tonight and think, okay, all right, uh, I'm just going to keep living like I'm living. And so I, I'm going to ignore the message of God. I'm not going to receive Jesus as my Savior. And I'll just get saved during the tribulation. Everything will be all right. I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to be all right. Because the Word of God says you will be deceived. There will be a strong delusion. You will believe the lie. You will take the mark of the beast and you will be eternally doomed. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm telling you the truth of God's Word. Amen. So, the first four seals were under the jurisdiction of the Antichrist. The opening of the sixth seal begins the administration of the supernatural judgment of God on this earth. 12 through 17 is the sixth seal, and we'll finish up with that. There will be a great earthquake, as the word of God says. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earth, earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell from the fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth forth her untimely figs when she is shaken by a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and even in every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and, and in the rocks of the mountain. And listen to what happens. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us. Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. That's God. And from the wrath of the Lamb. That's Jesus. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand. Who can survive the wrath of God? Matthew 24 and 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from the heaven and the power of the heavens shall be shaken. Folks, listen. There is a literal, this is not just some figment of an imagination of something, a bad dream a nightmare. No, this is literal God's wrath being poured out. Why, pastor? Why would God do this? How many times has God knocked on the heart's door of people and says, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. How many times did God deal with our hearts and we pushed them aside and we shunned him and we said, no, not now. Then you look to the cross and you think of the price that Jesus paid. He became sin who knew no sin. He condescended and came down from the portals of glory to this sin-cursed earth. He walked. He felt the pains that we feel in life. He felt rejection. He felt the bruising. He felt the beating. He felt them cry out, crucify him. He felt the spikes as they were driven into his hands and his feet and the crown of thorns were pulled down with thorns longer than the thistle's part were longer than my finger. Driven into his brow, his skull, blood coursing down his face, dying. But even in death, he cries out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, what mercy and grace was given at the cross. And you ask me, why would God permit this to happen? Because he paid the price for all sin. And if you find yourself in the tribulation, it was your choice. When his arms are open, all that will come to me, I'll in no wise cast out. Even at Calvary, you know, there have been literal judgments, earthquakes that have accompanied the judgment of God in history. Mount Sinai is a good example. The earthquake when God descended with fire. Rocks were smashed through earthquakes in Elijah's day. And even at the cross of Calvary, the earth did quake and the Bible says the rocks rent. The rocks actually shattered apart because of God. 
the blood of Jesus. See, this is really neat because what I've been teaching to you and preaching to you in, in the book of Genesis, the creator, earth recognized the creator when the blood of Jesus fell from his body and condescended and came down and touched the ground. The ground represented, or the ground rather, recognized the creator. This is the one. During the tribulation, the earthquakes are so great that stars will fall. And folks, I, I can't really paint an accurate picture of the terror that will be in those days. The situation becomes so unbearable that humanity pleads to die, and the Bible says death escapes them. Luke 21 and 26, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. I'm going to stop right here tonight. I'm telling you the worst. This is not the worst. The worst is still yet to come. This is so intensely bad. This is something in all the catastrophes the world has experienced combined together. They are not even a scratch on the surface of the intensity of the wrath of God poured out on this earth. We are the threshold of this event because you know what? I believe tonight, and this is not just something I thought of or whatever. It's because God's word says so. I believe we're living in the day that's going to see the coming of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but man, that excites my soul. I'm like John the Revelator in 22, chapter 22 when he says, Even so, come Lord Jesus. The question is tonight, and I close you with this question. The question is tonight, there's a fact that Jesus Christ is coming back. There is a fact that this world is headed for an encounter, a clash with God that the world will not, world will not win. The question is tonight, are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Are you ready tonight? Well, preacher, I'm doing the best I can, and I'm, you know, it's not on your best, because our best is still our worst. It's on what he did for us, the salvation that he provided. If you're not saved tonight, I don't know your heart's condition. All I can do tonight, I'm just, I'm just a herald. I'm just a proclaimer. I'm just a trumpet sounding. It's trying to tell you tonight, prepare to meet your God. Make sure you're saved. And if you are saved tonight, ensure tonight that you are serving God and that you are watching and praying for that day when he shall come. That when you hear that call from heaven, instantly you'll be taken into his presence. And your desire, as my desire is tonight, I want to hear him say, well done. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. What will you be said, what will he say to you when you stand before him? Make sure you know him tonight. Because his arms are open to receive you. And tonight, if you have received him, he wants you to live for him and serve him. Put him not last any longer. Put him first. And let him be the king of your life tonight. Would you bear his along? It's rarely a time that I give an invitation that I don't ask. I had a funeral this past um, Tuesday. Whether it's in a funeral, or whether it's in a hospital room, or whether it's in the pulpit, I, I try to never fail when the opportunity to ask people to ensure that they know Christ is their personal Savior. Has there been a place, time in your life that you asked Jesus to come into your heart and your life? Oh, yeah, many times, Pastor. No, no. There's not many times. There's only one time. And that time is when you really meant business with God. Have you come to Him tonight and received Him as your personal Savior? Do you recognize three important facts tonight as I shared this morning? Do you recognize that you're a sinner? All have sinned, all have missed the mark, all have failed. We all are, me too, badly. But I also look tonight to the cross 
And tonight, Jesus died for me, you, every person on the cross. The 8 billion plus people that are on earth right now, he died for every one of them. And then he extends tonight his grace and says, if you will come and confess your sin and ask for my forgiveness, I will forgive you and I will make you my child. If you haven't done that tonight, I encourage you, tonight is your night. Paul said to the church at Corinth, he says, Behold, today is the day of salvation. Now, N-O-W, now is the accepted time. I'll put it off. You may not have another opportunity. Don't put off Christ when he's calling you to salvation. Pastor Carlton, I'm just not sure. I don't know if I am or whether I'm not. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I don't know if I'm going to get there. I just don't know. But would you pray for me? Because really, in my heart and what I've heard tonight, I want to know. I want to know that I know Christ is my Savior. I want to know that I'm born again. I'm saved. Pray for me. I'm going to ask you to do one thing tonight. There's no calling you out. There's no dragging you down here. There's no offending you or hurting you. That's praying for you. I don't know that, but I want to. I want to know that I can know Jesus tonight. Would you slip your hand up right now? Anyone tonight? Thank you. Anyone else tonight? I, I need to know Jesus. You know, he's the solution for everything tonight. Not only the salvation of your soul and your guarantee of heaven, but also, you now have, and you will have, when you receive him, you have a problem solver. You've got a helper. You now have got hope in your life because you have Christ. Let's stand to our feet. So the invitation tonight is somewhat twofold. And we give invitations in this church at every service. Because I think it's important. Because God's word is important. And you need to receive him. If you don't know him tonight... I'm going to stand around front here. I ask you to do one thing tonight. Will you come down and let me pray with you and introduce you to this Christ and, and pray with you that you can leave tonight with the assurance of salvation? Or if there's needs in your life that you tonight have burdens on your heart, these altars are for you tonight. Father, right now, touch our hearts. Draw us to altars of prayer. Bring us tonight to the place of salvation and hope and help tonight. In Jesus' name.